CCTV 18 special conversations here from the B20 summit here in the capital. I'm Shireen Bhan and it is my pleasure to welcome on the program the co-chair of the B20 task force on skilling, workforce and mobility, Johnny Taylor. Thank you very, very much uh, for joining us here on the program. Let me start by asking you about your first impressions here from the B20 summit in India. Well, it's was mentioning, listen, it's nicer than it was in Indonesia, although it was wonderful. <laughs> The people here are wonderful. The, the environment is really wonderful. And what I'm really loving is the focus on the business and government partnership. Uh, you know, too often we have conversations around people. It's the feel good side of it all. And this is about business and how to make it to ensure that our economies thrive. So it's a great environment. Well, people do fuel business as well. Yes. And that's what I want to focus on because it's the co-chair of the task force on a very important issue, which is workforce mobility and skilling. Yes. Especially in the context of what we've gone through as a global economy with the pandemic. What has been the big realization? What have been the big takeaways and the key recommendations? Well, a couple of things we've realized is during the pandemic and shortly thereafter, people had an opportunity to pause and reflect on what they thought about work, their relationship with work, where they would work, when they would work, how much they would work, and what types of activities they wanted to engage in. All of that occurred in about a 90 day period from March of 2020 yes. until about July of 2020. Out of that, in this post pandemic world, what we've realized is that people want something different from work. Mm. Not only do they want to make a living, obviously they need to provide for themselves and their families, but they need, they need fulfillment. They need purpose and they want to know that what they do matters. And that, that's been the biggest takeaway is that issues like culture really matter. Formerly soft words like culture in an organization. Now those are hard words. The best talent want to know what type of culture are you going to offer me so that I can decide if I want to work with you mm. and for how long. Uh, one of the shifts that we saw through the pandemic, and that was a forced shift, was moving to work from home and yes. people started to experiment with hybrid work and so on and so forth. Now we're back in a phase where companies are mandating a return to work. That's right. Uh, how do you see this playing itself out uh, as the labor market, at least in economies like the US, continues to be fairly tight? That's right. Well, that's the tension. Uh, employees, we had the swing from nine to five Monday through Friday, and then everyone largely worked from home. And now we're swinging back to the middle. Employers are looking at productivity, for example, and saying, I know you could work remotely, but is that optimal? Or was the remote work suboptimal? Mm. Do you retain and build relationships with your colleagues, or is this just a transaction? That's the challenges that we're trying to sort. We're still in the middle of it. Anyone who tells you that they've sorted this remote work versus the hybrid work, they're wrong because the workforce is trying to figure out where it's going to settle. One thing that I can tell you for sure, we're not going back to the pre-pandemic time nine to five, Monday through Friday, mm. hybrid of some sort is mm. the future. Mm. So somewhere in the middle, is that basis the conversations that you're having with CEOs as they think about how do you design this sort of new workforce, uh, new workforce policies as well? Yes, every CEO I know, and we spend a lot of time with them have said, we won't go back to the old way, but we do have to find a way to work optimally. And that's somewhere in the middle. So we are seeing hybrid, whether it's four days in the office, one day remote, three, two. We're trying to figure out how to get the best of the employee while allowing them to integrate work and life. And that was the big challenge. Before the pandemic, it was all about work. Post pandemic, employees have had an opportunity to say, not so much. I also have a life outside of work, Mr. or Ms. Employer. Mm. So what does that mean then when we're talking about new ways of designing compensation, new ways of being able to attract talent more importantly, retain talent as well. Are companies thinking about this differently pre-pandemic? Yes, post-pandemic, what we're doing is we're thinking about it as if we think about our customers. We're actually, for the first time, surveying our employees, not just for satisfaction, but for engagement. The same sorts of analysis that we would engage in to find out who our customers are, what they like about us, what they don't like about us. We're now doing that with employees. So it's an employee first approach Absolutely. now? Absolutely, that's it, and it's the only way. In an environment, knowledge-based economies require that you focus on human beings and employees. Mm. You know, you talked about skills as well, and that's one of the issues that the task force has considered. Yes. And as we talk about a world that is adopting digital technology at a pace that we've never seen never. before, AI, ML, and so on and so forth, there are opportunities. But more importantly, how do you address the access deficits 
the skill deficits that currently exist and who is going to shoulder the burden of that? Well, so government, <laughs> largely. Government, the beneficiary of it all will be private sector industry, but the government has got to drive starting at K through 12, primary education. We've got to ensure it's not enough. India has a very young population, as you know, globally, but it's not enough to have a lot of people who are young if they don't have the skills that business needs. So early stage primary education will be critical and partnerships with private sector to say these are the skills we need or we think we're going to need because things are changing so quickly and this is what we're going to need to do to develop people for that. So the real shift now is no longer is business waiting on education to prepare its talent, it's actually partnering with education, primary through post-secondary to ensure that people have the skills they need in this new economy. You know, you talked about uh, the partnership between the government and the private sector. Yes. How do you see that evolving in the context of skills specifically? Here in India, for instance, uh, you know, the tech industry has been an industry that's actually helped skill its workforce. That's right. And we've seen that happen globally as well. But what kind of a partnership that will be relevant to addressing the needs of the future, the skills of the future, do you believe is something that needs to be thought through today? Well, yes, and that's what's so beautiful about the B20 and what you all have done uniquely in India is you've seen this partnership between government and industry. Industry understands that it is ultimately the consumer of an educated workforce, right? The citizenry. And so they've gone with, they've come into the room and said, this isn't just about what government or education wants. This is what industry will need. Together, we will create a thriving economy. That's the driver now. It's no longer education leading it for the sake of education. We're focused on outcomes. And the outcome in any new world is all about jobs and good jobs. People don't go to school just to amass degrees anymore and to be educated for the sake of education. They want good jobs. And to the extent industry can tell the education and the government sector, this is what we are hiring, you got a marriage made in heaven. Mm. But that's the problem, right? Yes. I mean, th that link is broken. Yes. Neither side are talking to each other, or at that's least right. seemingly so. Historically, we have not done so. That has changed, and it's changed in some meaningful ways, in part because of the pandemic. The discussions were occurring, but post-pandemic, an acceleration, the gap, of the deficit, if you will, in terms of the skills deficit globally. We've got a lot of people, but they don't have the skills that industry needs. And we said, we've got to close that gap. So governments are intentional about it. Public-private partnerships are everywhere, and we're seeing them full display here at the B20 here in India. So, you know, in terms of prioritization of the specific recommendations that your task force has yes. uh, put forward, uh, which hopefully the G20 will, will take up, What's your hope? If, if I were yes. to ask you like the top three, what, what is your hope? That we will literally create a culture where you are committed to lifelong learning. Because jobs no longer you can qualify for them and 30 years later after completing college, you're good. We've got to constantly reskill. So it's a lifelong commitment to reskilling. And secondly, that we reach all people, including women. One of the things that we've done in most developed societies, and especially so in developing societies, is we've not focused on the need to ensure that women can participate mm. from a skills standpoint. It's more than just raising and rearing children. Mm. They actually have to meaningfully uh, engage and be a part of the workforce. That's something we've not done. So two big goals is to bring women into the workforce with skills to do high level creative jobs so that they come into the middle class. And secondly, that they commit to lifelong learning. It's not just about achieving a degree or a credential, mm. but constantly reskilling and upskilling. Mm. One of course is the skills deficit, specifically when we talk about the gender gap. Yes. But you know, as you put together these recommendations, as you went through the process of consultation and discussion, what was the big takeaway on why we're seeing women dropping out of the workforce or not participating in the workforce? What continue to be the significant barriers? Some of it, and it really fall into two categories. It's the narrative, the presumption that we make about what women can do. Every society has, has holds women up for their ability to nurture and nature kids, but they don't think about them, generally speaking, as adding to the society and the economic viability of the country. And in fact, that's a mindset shift. And it does, it's just not being held by men. A lot of women hold those as well. In the US, I know, oftentimes we do studies where we ask women, if you're interested in a healthcare profession, what do you want to do? We assume women want to be nurses and not physicians. 
We make these assumptions about women and women believe it and men believe it. And as a result, the biggest obstacle is changing the mindset about what women can and mm. should expect to do in the workplace. If we can do that, we can solve for a significant amount of the problem. And then the second is access. You know, in many parts of the world, we do not educate women the way we educate men and young boys. And now that we're eliminating that barrier, if you will, removing that obstacle, we're seeing, in the United States in particular, law school classes, business school classes, STEM programs, are in many cases more women than men. Mm. We've seen a market shift. It was intentional in the United States, and we're seeing that in India right now. If we focus on it, we will resolve for it. So mindset, you can be whatever you want to be. There are no woman yeah. jobs and men jobs. And then secondly, we've got to ensure that you have access, full access to the types of education that will prepare you for the jobs of the future. And hopefully, we're going to see the participation improve as we build out this pipeline as well Absolutely. with the right kind of skills. That That is the hope. That's the but, but let's talk about India. Yes. Uh, you know. One of the big opportunities that every global CEO speaks of is the fact that this is a country that has the youngest working yes. population yes. Uh, and that opens up a plethora of opportunities. From your point of view specifically, how do you view the Indian market? Uh, young <laughs> and plentiful. Lots of them and they're young. This is exciting for the whole world. Last night I had the opportunity to speak with the Minister of Education and, and he was sharing with me that you ultimately have gone to 30, you set up these 30 centers and gone to the rest of the world and said, you know, during the pandemic, if you were short on healthcare workers, India is a source of talent for you. If you need technologists, we are a source of talent for you. So it's an amazing thing to see globally that we are relying on India to fuel the growth, not just in India, but around the globe. Uh, and specifically, as far as uh, you know, you you are concerned, how do you sort of leverage on this on this India opportunity, the growing market as well as the the workforce? Well, so at the risk of offending other parts of the world, you have a young, highly talented, highly motivated democracy. We think that is huge. We in the United States thus are partnering with India to tell the story around the world that India is the source of amazing talent, whether homegrown talent that stays in India and does the work here or is exported to the other parts of the world to do the work. We are going to take a break here and return with more conversation from the B20 Summit. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching our special coverage here from the B20 Summit. We're in conversation with Johnny Taylor. You know, linking workforce to the issue of mobility as well, yes, and it's not just it. mobility within within, within. Uh, a particular geography. It's about borderless uh, aspirations right. as well, and especially flat. with tech. Exactly, especially with technology. But you do have, uh, you know, visa restrictions and so on and so forth in place at the G20. How would you like world leaders to address the issue of workforce needs coupled with uh, mobility and other issues? Well, the good news for us is most of the world is getting old. Uh, we need the young talent. So in the past, when we put in place policies that did not encourage workforce mobility, now that you places like Japan, even in the US where people are older now, we need younger uh, workers and India is gonna be a source of it. So I think it's almost a product of, we need the talent, you have the talent, really highly skilled workers. And so what we've been able to do in the past, which is the luxury of excluding people, is now going away. We need them and thus the policies here are about how do we allow people to move more easily across borders. So do you believe that we are on the cusp of seeing some significant changes there in terms of policy? Because it's a need-based approach need. that right. countries will have to take. That's right. That's exactly it. In, in the past, it was a luxury. You, we would let you come into our country, name the country, if we wanted to. Now we actually need you and therefore the policy, the leverage has shifted. And we're seeing a significant amount of what had not been a resistance to, we're now embracing borderless work. But you know, what are the other trends that, uh, that you're watching for in the workforce? Because we've gone through this phase of the gig economy sort of taking shape and it has started to take shape here in India. We've now put some regulation in place as well. Yes. Uh, through the pandemic, you know, People are, are, of course, working from home, but people were also moonlighting. And That's in many right. cases, 
uh, tech companies in India said, no, you no. know, you can't do that. So right. what are the changes, the disruptions, the new trends uh, that you see evolving? The biggest one is mental health. Pre-pandemic, all of us globally were focused on physical health. And we talked about our employees Fitbits and gym memberships and all of those sorts of things. Post-pandemic, we had a new appreciation for the importance of mental wellness. Our employees are saying they need that, particularly as they moonlight. One of the things about moonlighting is you're now stressing your body. Instead of working eight or 10 hours, you're working 14, 16 hours, and it takes a toll on your mental well-being, which affects your ability to be a productive person at work. So we're seeing a significant shift in the conversation around mental health and wellness. And employers are having to pay attention to that in ways that they haven't in times past. Yes. That's probably the biggest and most pronounced difference in a pre-pandemic and a post-pandemic world is an appreciation but for mental health. But how are companies health. addressing that issue? I think it is being acknowledged there is a lot yes. more sensitivity to this, yes. but how are companies addressing that issue specifically? Well, we are now bringing in the same sorts of resources that we, in times past you'd bring in free gym memberships. We're now bringing in mental health counselors. We're saying that we are as interested in your mental well-being as your physical well-being. Our benefits programs and offerings aren't just focused on go see a medical doctor. They're saying twice a year, go have a mental wellness checkup as well. So we are being very intentional about destigmatizing mental health. In the past, it's such a negative taboo subject. Yeah. We're saying it's okay to have that conversation and encouraging our employees to take care of themselves mentally and physically. Absolutely, and I think that is the need of the hour. Well, speaking of disruption, yes. I want to understand from you how the HR world is being disrupted Ooh. today. Uh, because, you know, very often companies put policies in place and it should be putting people at the heart of it, not policies yes. at the heart of it, right? Yes, so it's yes, a, yes. policies need to work for people. People shouldn't have to work for policies. Is, are, we, are we seeing a disruption in the way that, you know, the, uh, there's a thinking on this front? It's more than a disruption. It's um it's like nothing you've ever seen, which is a wonderful time to be in HR. To be fair, in the past, HR was very much focused on payroll, benefits, the administrative work. And now in a knowledge-based economy, employees have realized that their differentiation is the quality of the employee that they can attract and retain. And so that means HR now, you've got to help us. You are a competitive business differentiator. You're not just a back office administrative function. And so we as an HR have had to be very intentional, very intentional about becoming far more business savvy, mm. responsive to the business, because without great people, the business doesn't win. Now. You know, you talked about the way that compensation is being looked at yes. or redone today. What is that going to mean in the long term in terms of wage inflation, yes. in terms of uh, the costs that people will have to start to factor in over the next few years? That is, it's the perfect question. And we're experiencing that in the US right now. We've seen hyperinflation when it's come to wage inflation, as you no doubt know. Well, people have not made the, the, the sort of connection between if an employer pays you 50% more, then the price of the good or the service must go up also. So it's this vicious cycle that we're currently experiencing in the United States. It's leading to a hyperinflationary environment, mm -hmm. and it's led largely by wage inflation. And we're seeing our Fed chair, Jerome Powell, in the US constantly talking about, we've got to slow the market down. We need 4% unemployment, and we've got to slow down the amount of, and, and the degree to which salaries are increasing, the wage, wages are, are growing. And also, and while at the same time, we've got to improve productivity. Ultimately, we don't mind paying more if we can get more out of you, because the consumer is unwilling to just agree to limitless increases. You know, uh in, in that uh, conversation of productivity, enhancing productivity, as well as technology adoption. Yes. What are you seeing play out there? And given just the fast pace of adoption that we're seeing and the big changes and the shifts that are taking place, what could it potentially mean? Because while a lot of us have been talking about the impact of technology on productivity, yes. it hasn't really borne out as was expected. Not yet, but it is on its way. And what we've seen, you've read Goldman Sachs reported 300 million jobs will essentially go away as a result, globally, as a result of AI adoption. Now, we know that hopefully if this plays out, it will create another 500 million jobs of a different type. But clearly automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence is all going to lead to better productivity for human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean human beings will go away. A new type of job will emerge and we will do higher quality, strategic value added work, not the monotonous, 
boring repeat work that can be automated by machines. Mm. You know, but unfortunately, the the boring, repeatable yes. jobs are the jobs that developing economies also require and need to keep their workforce gainfully employed. So, yes. what are the vulnerabilities that you foresee in terms of redundancies, the kinds of jobs that you believe are, are just not going to exist over the next five years, <laughs> and the kinds of jobs that will emerge on the back of the new opportunities that open up? Well, we're seeing just that, right? Reskilling is the name of the game. There's no question that if you are currently doing a job that can be automated, and I mean significantly automated, you will lose that job. And so our message to governments, to private sector everywhere, is that we've got to retool the masses such that they will have jobs. The existential threat that we are hearing, employees hear AI means I lose my job. Mm. And that is a threat that any society, any citizen will respond negatively to. We've got to say, yes, that job may go away. There's a new job on the horizon, and we simply have to prepare you, skill you to do that new work. So before I let you go, uh, you know, with all the changes that we've just talked about, with everything that you're working on and working with, is there another book on the anvil? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Actually, yes, and it's interesting. I'm working right now on something on diversity. Um, and diversity means different things in different parts of the world. In this part of the world, we're going to focus a lot on gender, equity, pay equity, opportunities for promotion, etc. And we alluded to that in the beginning. And in other parts of the world, it's race and increasingly age. Age is a factor. Uh, we have been a society that has the luxury of ignoring older workers, actually discriminating against them. And we're going to take that head on in the profession because as the world ages, we're going to need people to work longer. It's not just a nice to have, it's a must have. Absolutely. Johnny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here uh, on CNBC TV 18 at the B20 Summit in New Delhi. We appreciate your time and we wish you the very best of luck with the book and all your future endeavors. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. That's it then on this special edition of CNBC TV 18's Conversations from all of us here on the team. For now, goodbye and many thanks for watching.